Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. This month, the Spark theme relates to pediatric pain management. I'm pa Paula Robeson, your host for the next hour. Children's Healthcare Canada acknowledges that our offices, located in Ottawa, are on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize that the, co the contributions that Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this country, our province, and the, and the community. Today, during National Pain Awareness Week, we're delighted to partner with the Child Bright Network to bring you Pain for Children with Severe Neurological Impairment, How to Get to Tomorrow. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Hal Seiden is a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. He's also the medical director for Canuck Place Children's Hospice and division head palliative medicine at BC Children's Hospital both located in Vancouver, British Columbia. Dr. Seiden has expertise in pediatric palliative care and pain management, and he has worked for 20 years with children living with complex conditions and life-threatening diseases. Dr. Seiden has a particular interest in pain assessment and pain management. And Dr. Tim Oberlander is a physician scientist whose work bridges developmental neurosciences and community child health. As a clinician, he manages complex pain in children and has had a particular interest in managing pain in children and youth with developmental disabilities. As a researcher, his primary interest has been in studying how early life experiences shape the stress, pain, and related neurobehavioral outcomes during childhood. Just a reminder that we record all our webinars. As mentioned in the introductory video, please type your questions into the question box at any time, and I'll follow, prompt you via the chat as well. And I'll pose your questions to our guests following the presentation. It's now my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Seiden. Thank you, Paula. Good morning, everybody. Um, Tim is putting up the slides for us right now. There we go. Fantastic. So. Um, I'm Dr. Hal Seiden, and uh, as Paula said, and I want to say um, my, my appreciation to both uh, Children's Healthcare Canada and Child Bright for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, this is going to be a different kind of webinar. It's going to be um, a conversation between Tim and I across a number of topics. Um, and so there will be slides and presentation, but mostly it'll be a chat uh, over the combined uh, 40 or 50 years of experience we've now had in working uh, with children with pain. Uh, next slide, please. I'd just like to say I'm, I'm really oh. thrilled to uh, <laughs> to see you, Hal. And good morning. Good morning. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts about how to get to tomorrow and uh, share with you some of the, the thoughts that I've had about this really important topic. And yes, I will uh, click to the next slide. Right. So Tim and I are sitting on land here, uh, um, unceded ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples of the Squamish, um, Stolo, Salatooth, and Musqueam nations. And we are grateful for this privilege that we can um, live and play and work in, this, uh, in these territories. Um, the many uh, peoples here um, uh, on the uh, nations who who uh, provide uh, care. Uh, it says healthcare, but it really is care for people and families here in British Columbia. Next slide, please. I think the next slide introduces us 
which Paula did a very nice job of. There's pictures of us. Um, we have nothing to disclose. We keep waiting for one year that we will have something um, to disclose some conflict, but we don't yet. But we will talk about medications that are off-label because that's most of what we do in pediatrics. So the learning objectives are here for you. And we hope that after the end of today's session with us, you'll recognize um, the way that children with severe, uh, significant neurologic impairment or severe neurologic impairment, SNI, present with sometimes very subtle um, uh, markers, signs and symptoms of pain. Um, we're gonna discuss, and this is part of the PIO uh, Child Bright Project, uh, our study on a systematic approach to a better understanding and hopefully then treating pain to children. And lastly, um, uh, what to do when, when that doesn't work. And um, we know that we're still in early days of really understanding what works for children. So I'm gonna throw it to Tim because Tim has a case that he's gonna describe, which is very much a typical case of the kinds of children that we see with this condition. Yeah. Thanks, Hal. Uh, yes. Uh, so just to sort of start our conversation, we, we, um, we probably should uh, ground ourselves in, in a, in a uh, case that uh, we're all familiar with. This is a composite case and uh, any uh, reflection of uh, an individual child is only uh, coincidental. Um, and it was really uh, designed to illustrate uh, the complexity of care uh, and pain management in this setting. So uh, this is a child who's uh, 14. Uh, she's nonverbal, uh, it depended on non-oral feeding, uh, has severe cognitive impairment, uh, has a history of dental abscesses, and uh, proxismal behaviors are characteristic of, of daily life uh, that include self-interest behavior. Uh, because of the medications that have been used uh, to manage the behavior, uh, she also now is being treated for hyperinsulin and metabolic syndrome, and as well has an ongoing problem with constipation. Daily typical pain in the setting uh, is uh, has been remarkably difficult to identify, but uh, in talking with her mother, uh, she thinks that the pain is located in her back, neck, shoulders, and it's reflective in uh, facial grimacing, grinding teeth, repetitive head motion. Uh, there's also a history of nausea and vomiting. Um, nausea is difficult to understand because it, uh, it may be that there's rumination uh, that might reflect that, but it's unclear whether uh, what, this, what the actual signs of nausea are in the setting. But uh, there has been a question that was raised by a community provider with, with whether this was a reflection of migraine. Uh, these behaviors were treated with NSAIDs, tryptans, opioids because of the sense that maybe there was a migraine. There's no reason to believe that migraines don't occur in, across the entire developmental spectrum. Uh, other medications were used, but not consistently. There was a um, sort of as needed basis use of the medication. So it's unclear whether the medications actually were working or not, uh, which is a, a theme I want to come back to, Hal, because, you know, uh, you and I have uh, had. Uh, many situations where we're using really good medications that don't seem to work. Well, what's that all about? And and I'm gonna I'm gonna post that question uh, for discussion uh, as this conversation goes on. Uh, interestingly, there there seems to be a uh, a pattern of behavior that that gets better when uh, Georgia is in a dark room with lights turned off. Again, sort of supporting this migraine question. There's a dis disrupted sleep cycle. The sensory interest behavior uh, seems to get better. Uh, with the with uh, these dark room dark room and quiet uh, eye shades, uh, there's also abdominal distension, which suggests that maybe there's another process that's going on, um, and that the overall quality of life uh, is uh, very uh, encumbered by fatigue, uh, uh, poor tolerance of outings, sitting in a chair, uh, doing all of those activities of daily living that provide joy and pleasure. The story gets more complex or worse. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, here's a list of medications, which actually uh, is a little embellished, but it doesn't, it's not that far off from everyday cases that I think you and I are, are, um, are familiar with. And as you can see, there are many medications that are both uh, everyday medications. There are many that are PRN. Some are uh, uh, look like they're managing core symptoms. Others manage the symptoms of the side effects of the core medications. It's very difficult to, uh, to figure out what comes first and what comes second, but uh, clearly uh, the daily medication routine for this individual is, um, is long, complex, and it's almost as if every moment is spent uh, giving uh, uh, medication. 
But the story gets even more complicated because as we know, individuals like Georgia live within a, a, a network of providers, uh, both within a hospital setting, within a community. And while I illustrated the care providers in a linear fashion, it's actually not linear yeah. at all. Uh, and it's really quite a uh, uh, interconnected uh, set of uh, circles. Um, but this really gives you an idea of, of this uh, broad team here. And we're, so, we're going to we're, we're going to come back to that point later, as you'll see. the The, the team is not just broad, but it's disorganized. as a It's a major a major theme here. Sorry, Tim, carry on and talk about the different kinds of pain. Yeah. So so then the real question is, after all of that, uh, what is pain in the setting? Hal, uh, let's uh, unpack some of this and, and see where we can go um, with. Um, uh, a definition that seems to meet this uh, the setting. Oh, I think you're going to do that because you did ah. such a good job talking about this part. <laughs> I mean, it, both of us can do it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the so the, the question that we're we're faced with here is, uh, you know, how do we manage pain when pain is really such a subjective phenomena that's dependent on self appraisal. Um, and I think that that uh, I'm just going to throw it out there that I, you know at this point I, I'm, and you talked about us being in this field for combined 60 years. Yes, it is about that. Um, I have come to think about it as it really is what the child reports, uh, the patient reports, yeah. what the parent caregiver says it is, and um, I think that's a it's a very uh, sound way to start. Um, but. We also are faced with this question of what happens when self-report in the context of medical complexity is not uh, available to us, and uh, what is a complex pain as a part of a life with a complex medical condition like Georgia has, and it, and in that sense, we need to um, we need to unpack this a little further. Uh, in order to do that, um, <clears throat> we need to go to uh, a general definition that we all uh, have agreed on in the in the pain field generally, which is what the IS has defined pain as an unpleasant sensory emotional experience associated or resembling that associated with or actual potential tissue damage. The important thing is that pain is uh, a learned uh, is learned through uh, lived experience and a person's report of pain should always be respected. And that is true across the entire developmental spectrum. Pain has a usual adaptive role. And I think we have to understand that uh, it's a health giving safety danger signal. Uh, but in the presence of a developmental disability, uh, that signal can be under-recognized and, un and leading to under-treatment. And I think it's a really important to recognize this as a limit or a limitation or potential limitation of this general definition. So verbal description really is only one of several ways that pain can be expressed. And uh, I think it's important to emphasize that the inability to communicate does not change the possibility that a human experiences pain uh, and that uh, just to, the absence of words is not good enough to say pain does not exist. So um, another really important thing, Hal, that I think is worth uh, emphasizing is uh, the uh, four types of pain. That pain is not just a solitary uh, hardwired phenomena that occurs across the neuro axis, but it really um, uh, reflects uh, at some level its origin. And I think that if one understands the differences between these types of pain, we can come to understand not only where in the neuroaxis pain uh, could occur, what might have caused it, and then, of course, what are modifiable uh, treatments that uh, could, ident could be identified for the specific mechanism that we think exists here. So briefly, uh, I want to just highlight nociceptive pain. That's the type of pain that you get with a cut finger or broken bone. That's stimulation of peripheral nerve fibers. Then there's inflammatory pain that, uh, pain that comes with infection or inflammation. That typically gets better after the inflammation gets uh, treated. Uh, there's a third type of pain that is uh, critical to distinguish from those previous two types, which is neuropathic pain. This occurs uh, because of nerve-related injury. And the interesting part of this is that the characteristics of neuropathic pain are really quite different than the type of words that are used to describe inflammatory or nociceptive pain. Things like burning, tingling, sharp, or even worse, I can't describe it. There are no words for it. And in fact, that's uh, that, when you hear that, the, the alarm bell should go off. Mm, maybe that's nerve-related pain. There's a fourth type of pain that I think we're all becoming very aware of, and it's recently been uh, described as nosoplastic pain. And this is uh, a, a pain that reflects 
uh, altered sensory processing in the uh, central nervous system. Um, it's multifocal, it's widespread, it's intense, and it reflects long-term changes in the way the, the, the nervous system functions. You know, I think when you and I were in medical school, we uh, uh, were taught that the brain is, you know, hardwired and not plastic, right? I'm right. sure right. you were there, yeah. right? Not true. I was I was awake during that particular lecture too. Oh, that's so reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so great, because uh, uh, you know I was awake too during that part, and uh, I thought the brain was was uh, you know uh, a solid uh, invariant uh, organ. Not true at all. In fact, it uh, it's plastic uh, right through our entire lifespan, which is really the good news uh, part about it. But that's equally true of uh, children with developmental disabilities that that we somehow have to recognize that and harness that plasticity for treatment. I'm just going to oh, pause you. Yeah. I'm going to pause you there and say a couple of things about that slide. One is, is that nociplastic is a term that was first um, used in 2017 by the IASP. So it's gaining traction, but many of you will not know it, but it is a very particularly useful term. It was really designed to talk about people with things like chronic um, uh, complex pain, uh, fibromyalgia, um, uh, myalgic uh, encephalitis and so forth. And, um, but it's a very useful term. And I, Tim and I and others think that it really applies to children with severe neurologic impairment in part. The, the children that we're talking about can have all four types of pain and they can have them simultaneously and they interact. Um, and, uh, but having this nosoplastic concept is actually key to the further work that we're doing, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about is how do we know, so we've got, we've described Georgia, she's nonverbal, she's got difficulty expressing uh, or telling us whether she's having pain, where it is, and so forth. Uh, can I have the next slide there, please? And um, there's a number of things that we're going to go through in the next few minutes. And one is, um, you know, it says self-report, but we have an observer, we have somebody who cannot necessarily self-report. So you're very heavily reliant on parents. And I think that's fine. Parents are the, the best communicators of these children. Sometimes there's a, there's a trusted caregiver, the uh, school aide, the caregiver who comes to the home. Um, and taking them at, when I say face value, meaning that whatever they're describing, they may not understand the underpinning neuropathophysiology, but they're certainly going to describe to you. And taking a very detailed history is really a critical part of that. And then you have to start thinking about the potential sources of pain. And we're going to show in a little while the very long list of what you have to think through. Pain behaviors are those things that you say, what is it that this person is doing when they are in pain? Are they grimacing? Or do they have tears? Are they vocalizing? Are they withdrawing? Um, there are some tools, and we're going to talk about just in, in a minute. And again, we'll get to other considerations. Can I have the next slide, please? No, didn't pop up. There we go. Oh, can you, I think it's one back. Okay. So there's actually three different tools that we're going to introduce to you now. This is the first of three, and it's the non-communicating children's pain checklist. Lynn Bro and Pat McGraw and others in um, at Dalhousie uh, in the early 2000s developed this and continued to work on it. We use this a lot, the Nick Pick, it's called. And um, it was um, very carefully designed. Um, it's not hard to use the Nick Pick. It takes... I think parents tell me that once they've gotten used to using it, it takes them about two minutes to go through it. Uh, it's been tested as being reliable between nurses or caregivers who don't know the child and the parent. Uh, and it's a 30-item it's a measure that has a list of um, common behaviors that nonverbal and cognitively impaired individuals uh, display. So we find this a very useful tool. One of the little limits of it, and you have to kind of work around this, is it was normed with a two-hour observation window. And we're not interested in two-hour windows because they're snapshots in time. So we tend to stretch it out and work with parents to say, tell us the worst part of the day or what the last day has been like and so forth. We can go to the next one. Many of you are probably familiar with the flack, the faces, legs, arms, um, uh, uh, crying and, and um, uh, consolability uh, scale. It's now the flack. There's several different FLAX uh, versions. Uh, Terry Volpa Lewis at Michigan uh, developed this uh, with her colleagues uh, many years ago as primarily uh, as a post-operative um, assessment of pain in nonverbal children. And uh, the nurses in the uh, recovery room needed to know whether the children were experiencing pain. 
again, one of the, I think, strengths, it's, it's well-developed, it's been well-studied, One of the, and it's very easy to use. I think there's a couple of limits around the FLAC in that it is a point-in-time assessment. So if you're going to try to use it for a larger assessment of a child, you have to figure out how am I going to use it during a day for a child. In other words, I'm not in the recovery room, I'm in my clinic. Do I say to the parent, give me the worst behavior of the day? Please sample your child's behavior at noon, 6 p.m. and bedtime. You have to kind of work with how you're going to use this tool, which is very much a point in time tool. I think the repertoire of behaviors is appropriate, but less comprehensive than what you see in the NICPIC. But we are using this tool in our studies as well. And clinically, it's a very useful tool. Um, next slide, please. And this is sort of one of my favorites, but probably the most, I, I'm going to use the word awkward to use that Anne Hunt in the United Kingdom developed the pediatric pain profile. Um, it looks very busy. It has numerous elements, but you don't have to use all of them. And it's downloadable for free from her website uh, and use many years. Hasn't been well studied as much as the other two. What I like about the PPP is it's very individualized for each child. In other words, you go through a pain history with a parent and say, what does Georgia do? Tell me how you know when Georgia is in pain. Tell me what you know when Georgia is content. And it gives you these assessments. So each child creates their own base and their own ceiling. And then you study it. A little bit challenging to use for research because you can't generalize very easily, but really terrific if you want personalized, uh, a personalized approach to parents and not that really that hard to use. As I say, once you get used to the documents, you can figure out how to pare them down pretty quickly. So the next slide, please. So I think this goes back to you to think about all the causes because you and I have talked about so far, the number of physiologic types of pain, neurophysiologic, nosoplastic, neuropathic, et cetera. We've talked about how you can measure pain and all you're doing is measuring it. Is it bad today or less bad today? Does the medicine work or not work? And um, But this is a population where it's not easy to say, did you twist your finger? Did you bump into something? Or have you been sitting in your chair too long? So um, we have to find ways to think about, first of all, the very broad causes of pain, which are actually probably broader than what you and I experience in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, and as Tim said at the very beginning, according to the ISP, being nonverbal, and, and it's not just this population with severe neurologic impairment we have who are nonverbal, uh, is no reason to think that you don't experience pain. We know neonates and premature babies experience pain, so that's a nonverbal population. We have a population of elderly people in our society now who are no longer able to express where they're experiencing pain due to advancing brain disease, and that's a nonverbal population. And when we go on the pain listserv, the international listserv, there are many people from the veterinary world not surprising, who are very interested in work in nonverbal populations because that's what they deal with in their day-to-day -day work. So it's actually much, much broader than this segment that Tim and I are talking about this morning with you. And so why don't, why don't you talk about, because uh, you do a really nice job of that differential of like yeah. all the things that can go on for Georgia. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, two points I, I want to raise, one of them is that it's actually not that long ago uh, that uh, there was erroneous beliefs that individuals with developmental disabilities uh, did not experience or feel pain because it was not measurable. So one would assume if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Well, actually, that's that's not true. Um, and uh, uh, it was really in the uh, early 90s that we began to uh, systematically unpack the question of pain in children with developmental disabilities. And I would I would say that... Uh, Sunnyhill had a had a role. Yeah, you and Maureen and some of the early studies in the nine. Some of your early studies in the nineties were about uh, using a really clever technique of sham uh, influenza injections. Yes, I was. I was <laughs> I'm just reminding you. <laughs> anti vaxxers would have loved like a sham injection. You know, like why not? Yeah, I think so, that, 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 <laughs> but it raised some really interesting questions about. Um, pain sensitivity right. and uh, in the absence of uh, the signals that you and I look for. Uh, and so I think, it, you know, the, the, the really the core point that I think I want to just emphasize that you just made was that there's no reason to believe that pain is any less experienced by children and youth with development disabilities. And that's true across the entire life and also sentate, uh, uh, sentient uh, beings and probably uh, uh, aplasia is also experience uh, stress and pain in a in a slightly different way. So uh, pain is a universal phenomenon, and we have to we have to start off by saying it's there, and our challenge is to figure out how to measure it, assess it, and then do something about it. How? 
this is this is just a slide I often put up. This is from um, one of Ann Hunt's studies. Um, but you know, for the parents and, and potentially the clinicians on the call who have dealt with a lot of families whose children have this kind of pain, this quote is really um, and, and the the project that Ann has has a number of quotes like this. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's the daily life of some people. And um, I'm very fortunate that at Canuck Place, I can admit children into the hospice with this kind of pain and we give parents a break, but we can also do a, a workup. And um, that's not always available to people uh, who don't have a, a center for respite or a, a hospital that's willing to do these admissions. So um, I think the next slide, I'm, I have to check my slides. Oh, here's the causes, yes. So let's go yeah. through that. Yeah, so let's let's take a look and see some of the things that we think are are underlying. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, this is okay. There we. That's the slide. Yeah, yeah. The sticky slide problem. Uh, clearly, it's early in the morning here on the West Coast. Uh, so you know, this goes back to what we were taught in medical school, which is you know, what's the differential diagnosis? What do we think about? And you know, I, I think that this this slide uh, kind of summarizes common things that one needs to think about when you're thinking, well, where's the, where's the source of the pain? And uh, I think that um, uh, just like uh, all other areas of, of medicine, you really have to be, uh, or healthcare, you really need to be systematic um, and um, think about what's possible, what's ordinary, uh, because they're all the things that children across the developmental spectrum will, will experience that are equally possible here, like a dental abscess, uh, ear infection. Um, but then there are other things that are specific to uh, children with uh, neurologic impairments, such as um, uh, post-surgical pain, uh, metabolic genetics disorders that might underlie their, their impairment, uh, spasticity, dystonia, uh, reflux. Uh, and then all of the other iatrogenic things that happen with medications that cause uh, stones, urinary stones, um, maybe uh, corneal opacity because of steroids, uh, fractures because of immobility and osteopenia, dislocations. So the, the list is, is only put up here as a discussion point. And uh, yeah. Well, I, I think it's partly a discussion point, but I think it's, you know, the child with the otitis media is you've got... I just saw it somewhere, ENT on the right. The three-year-old says, pulls, or the, the toddler pulls at her ear. The three-year-old says, mommy, my ear hurts. These kids are just crying or they're, or they're grimacing or they're twisting. Um, and, you know, you mentioned uh, dental abscesses and caries. These kids can often, if they're orally adverse, can be really hard to brush their teeth and get their teeth cleaned. Then you have to sedate them to get them and then to a dental exam. So none of this is, is simple stuff for these children. And, um, um, you know, when when you look at and you mentioned the iatrogenic causes, a lot of these kids have hip dysplasia. Then they undergo the hip surgery. They have spine. They have scoliosis. They get rod instrumentation. So there's a whole lot of uh, layered on things that that go on for these children. But you can't focus on one of them. You have to look at this picture each and every time you you meet a child who who the parent comes in and says, "I think he or she is experiencing pain." So. If we know it, the likely cause, it must be simple to work up. Uh, yes, no, the answer is, is clearly no. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's why we're here. Yeah. So, so yeah. oh, so here's the typical evaluation, and I'm gonna. This is one of those little animated slides. So, parent comes in, mom brings Georgia into the pediatrician and says, "Who does H and P for the non clinicians as history and physical?" Okay, then what do they do next? Well, they get some blood work. I don't know why, but they do. Go on next, and then they get an X-ray of the kidneys and the bladder. And then they send them to orthopedic surgery, who then gets a spine x-ray and then does another history and physical. By the way, this is taken from real charts. Then they send them off to the gastroenterologist who gets some more blood work. And by the way, the blood work hurts. The spine x-ray probably hurts. Being GI people, they want to do an endoscopy. So they do their endoscopy and they find nothing, uh, but they start a PPI anyhow. Somebody does another history and physical and I'm losing track, starts them on a non-steroidal and uh, gets another hip x-ray and somebody else starts them on melatonin because the child's sleep is disrupted and sends them off to neurology who starts baclofen, gets a couple of urines, does another history and physical, gets another urine. And that's the seating evaluation. Sorry, it doesn't show up well. Somebody starts chloral hydrate 
I'm going to just pause there. Can you just go back that slide? <laughs> so <laughs> this, it, it, I, this <laughs> how how it's it's the calamity cascade. It's, it's the calamity cascade, yeah. and it's also that the universe of of negatives is infinite. So everybody keeps repeating these studies, and you know this goes back. Tim had that linear. Uh, that linear drawing of all the caregivers, well, that included community and school. But if you just look at the doctors, the clinicians involved, this is what they're doing. It's highly uncoordinated. It's it's not quite random, but it's everybody. It's the old, you know, um, five blind men in the elephant view. Everybody sees only the thing that's in front of them as specialists. And these children are surrounded by specialists. Let's go to the next slide. So Tim and I, oh, well, okay. I think I want to go to the next slide here. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think that I, I think the, the critical thing is uh, when you're faced with a map like that, what do you do? And well, so Hal and I actually, uh, and Hal in particular, okay. said, "Okay, we're going to make this really simple. We're going to no, 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 no. You're telling the story wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what we did is we said we're going to try a medication trial. That's what we're leading into is the pilot study. Yeah. Okay. So we said, oh, so we <laughs> said first of all, yeah, you can put that one up, right? But put up that slide, the next one with 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 George Bush. Nope, it's not coming up. There you go. So the first thing we said is we said, look, children have pain, which we know is this kind of this activation of the pain system. But at the time, we didn't understand no soplastic condition. And people, people, everybody gets to be irritable and aggravated. And so we didn't understand to what extent are these children expressing behavior, especially children with non uh, uh, nonverbal children, as a form of just, I'm upset, I'm aggravated. And I will give you a very quick example of a child who often stays at Canuck Place at the hospice for rest, but it was often crying, often crying, did a evaluation. This is a child we've known for many years. But whenever his mother picked him up and went home, he was great. And it turned out he was homesick. So, you know, the behavior, this, this phenotypical behavior, and we hope George Bush isn't hurting this child, this child is irritable. So the phenotypical behavior has to be, we call it pain and irritability of unknown origin. In other words, you've got a behavior and you're trying to sort out what it is. But where we really started in 2009 or 10 was to say, let's do a medication study. And it, it, it led to this paper, Physician Variability in Treating Pain and Irritability of Unknown Origin in Children. But in order to do this drug study, we sent out letters to pediatricians uh, across our, our region here and said, send us children who you've thoroughly worked up for pain and irritability of unknown origin. And when they get to Tim and me, we've got this really fancy, complicated system, this medication trial that we're going to do. And it's, it was like Rube Goldberg. And here's the next slide. So of all the children who were seen by us, they were followed by nine clinical subspecialty teams on average, and the range was six to 14, again, speaking to that earlier slide of the cascades. And not a single one of these kids, I think that's the next slide, if you pop up the next one, um, not a single one had actually completed a full evaluation. In other words, these are children who had, had all these subspecialists doing pieces of a puzzle, but nobody had done the things that I'm showing here, that nobody had comprehensively done that list of things to say, Wow, there's this broad differential. If you go back to Tim's picture of the, the blue the blue figure with all that, no one has actually done this comprehensively, put it all together as a package. So when we brought these children into the medication trial, which actually almost never occurred, what we found is that he and I had to rapidly do that workup and combine it. And of without looking at the problem, all the green boxes are kids that we completed. And you can see the pain scores drop dramatically um, in the four or five children for whom we actually completed it. Uh, these were by these, these were Nick Peck pain scores. And there was a dramatic decrement in their scores. And all of the parents were very satisfied with the outcome. And that's because we'd simply put together the package very well. I will say that one of the things we added, if you just pop back to that slide, sorry, it, we added into this is that we had a nurse, and that's part of the current study we're doing, who followed the families very closely and was a point of contact. And it's one thing we haven't it's our next study is to say, what is that role of that nurse as a resource for families to touch base and to continually reevaluate um, uh, how the pain pathway is going? Let's go on to the next slide. So that le led to the ch current Child Bright uh, project, which is going to pop up, which was we said, hey, we did this rapid fire, very focused sequence by, I'm going to use the term expert very loosely, but by two clinicians with lots of experience. Can we broaden this, could this become an actual clinical guideline? And it led to the current study under Child Bright, optimizing the management. What a, what a terrible title, but I'm really bad at titles um, uh, with severe neurologic impairment. And you can see all the many people who uh, were participating on the study. Um, let's go to the next slide. The study is currently underway. And on the right-hand side gives you 
kind of a key to it, but really the key part is the third um, box down that says randomized. So families enroll in the in the in the study. Uh, they are randomized. It's called a waitlist randomization, meaning nobody gets placebo, but you sit on a waitlist during which we monitor pain for children on the waitlist, which is the placebo arm versus the pathway arm, and then. Um, we then measure at various points at the end. Um, one of the other things that I really like about this study is that one of the things that we're measuring is parents' well-being as well. I think that a parent is almost the best index of whether their child is doing well. If the parent is um, sleeping well, able to get to their work or whatever their activities are, feeling more rested, feeling more uh, calm, um, that tells us that the child, that's one marker that the child is actually doing better. But we're also doing uh, very close assessments of the um, uh, of the child themselves and the parents fill out p- very short pain surveys that take a few minutes. Uh, and again, we've built in a very uh, strong nursing arm into this uh, pathway. And in fact, the doc is pretty much in the back seat. They do the they do this very kind of comprehensive um, evaluation. And um, what we're looking for in the pathway. And by the way, my our colleague Ayel Cohen at Toronto says this is just a randomized trial of common sense. But of course, common sense is often in rare in rare supply. Um, what we're looking for is we want to rule in or rule out those nociceptive inflammatory causes, the ones that were on the left hand of Tim's slide. Because if you say, guess what? It's the seating problem. It's the hip dysplasia. It's the stones. You've got something you can treat right away very readily. Once you've taken that off the deck, you're, what you're left with pretty much for these kids because they don't seem to experience crushing nerve injury is maybe an aversion of neuropathic pain, but most likely no subplastic pain, which is a whole nother thing. But you've now taken that big slide of all that stuff moving around that I had that animated slide and narrowed it down and said, guess what? We're not dealing with that. You don't need to go to six other specialists. You don't need another spine x-ray and you certainly don't need more blood work. We need to think about how to deal with no subplastic pain, which we're going to talk about towards the end. Um, Tim, if you just go to the next slide, this is a spoiler, and it's and I and it's not a spoiler alert because I'm not gonna, it's not popped up yet. Sorry. Oh, there we are. This is the pathway, and there's a lot missing from this slide because we don't tell you what goes into each of these pieces because the study is still ongoing. So there's history and physical, and then there's some screening testing for things that aren't obvious at that. But um, the pathway is not that complicated; just one has to follow it, and we hope. Right now, we're doing in multi-steps that a good pediatrician or community clinician of any kind trained in this will be able to do this as a pathway. But we want to prove, and I think children with these conditions deserve the highest quality evidence, as we all do. So we're actually going to level one evidence, which is a randomized controlled trial of this clinical pathway. And by the way, if you're in any um, in Ottawa, Toronto, Calgary, or um, British Columbia, we encourage you to go to our study. Uh, you can find it through Child Bright, and uh, you can also find it through paindetectives.org, which I will put into the chat at the end, because we're still recruiting into 2022 for the study. The next slide, please. So what? So now what? So Tim and I have done this great study. We say, this child, Georgia, actually, she doesn't have a nociceptive cause. She's not injuring herself. She doesn't have an inflammatory cause. We see no ongoing inflammation. There's no abscess. There's no stones. Now, what do we do? Because it's some version of that brain pain, no soplastic pain. So I'm going to throw it over to Tim because he's going to do the next section. Uh, yes, you, you can be you can be very rigorous. Uh, you can be very smart. You can choose uh, the right pathway. Uh, you can use the right drugs. Um, but uh, uh, there are times when uh, even being right, uh, you can end up in a in a dead end. Uh, and you can end up with therapeutic failure. And the question is, uh, do you stop there? What, do, what else do you consider? And uh, how do you get out of being stuck? Which is really the, the subtext of what we're talking about this morning. In the next few slides, I just want to talk, uh, Hal, about some of the, the drug-related uh, factors that we should consider when we end up with therapeutic failure. So this is a, a setting, as you remember, uh, of polydrug use which raises a huge question of drug-drug interactions. And drug-drug interactions uh, really um, uh, uh, come down to what's what's going on in terms of metabolism of the drug. How is the drug being broken down? What about the dynamics, uh, the drugs, uh, uh, the pharmacodynamic factors, like how well is the blood-brain barrier intact? Uh, What's the relationship between concurrent illnesses and 
and factors like tolerance, which uh, is a quite an issue um, with drugs that have uh, um, like opioids. Uh, and then of course, uh, pharmaceutics are equally important because the physical compatibility of the drug uh, given orally may not be the same as given through a G, G tube uh, when it's crushed. And so one has to think about maybe the drug is not really arriving in, a, in an active form. Uh, other factors that I think are worth thinking about, but, are, but uh, I'll only touch on briefly here are questions of genetics, uh, the roots of administration and adverse drug reactions that are, could occur for a whole variety of, of idiosyncratic individual child um, uh, situations where really good drugs get disqualified because one thinks, oh, there's an allergic reaction or there's an adverse drug reaction, but really it could be just a drug-drug interaction. Uh, and with that in mind, um, uh, and this is very slow in changing. Um, with that in mind, uh, we have to think about uh, one really important component of uh, drug metabolism, which is how does uh, the liver and its constituent enzymes break down the drugs? And I've just illustrated um, some of the critical enzymes that are needed for uh, for drug metabolism. What's really important to remember is that about 40% of all drugs are dependent on one enzyme, CYP3A4 or A5. And what happens then is that if you've got one, um, one enzyme, but you've got a lot of drugs that are dependent on that one enzyme, you can uh, over uh, time end up with um, uh, drug interactions whereby the, the uh, enzyme becomes saturated or it becomes inhibited because it's being competed. Uh, there's a lot of competition for its action. Um, uh, but there are other enzymes that can be induced by other drugs, and that adds to uh, drugs that get metabolized faster as opposed to slower. So you can end up with both toxic effects and you can end up with no effects, and it's all due to what's happening at the level of the liver. And uh, this slide just illustrates that this uh, is a critical step in determining what drugs uh, work and which drugs don't work. So I've tried to illustrate some of that here in this slide, which says, okay, we're going to take the three most. Oops, he is, he, you're friend. frozen there for a second. Fine. Okay, carry on. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we're going to take uh, the three most common uh, enzymes and uh, look at what drugs uh, are metabolized by them. And that's in the, uh, the next column called substrate. And these are common drugs that are used in a setting. But you can see that some of those drugs that are substrates for those enzymes are also inhibitors of that very enzyme. So you could end up with somebody who's on cyclobenzaprine and clozapine at the same time, uh, and uh, uh, maybe an estrogen, and you could find that they could actually become toxic uh, because some of those drugs actually inhibit. But there are also dr drugs and everyday environmental phenomena like smoke, uh, broccoli sprouts, um, and uh, nutraceuticals uh, like, like broccoli uh, bro and uh, cannabis that, uh, that can actually induce some of those enzymes. So you can end up with actually no uh, um, effect. And that's equally uh, uh, valid as a reason why good drugs fail. Um, I think it's also important to consider that even under these conditions, we got to step back and say, well, what else could be going on? Um, who's the observer? Uh, experienced caregivers are really essential to figuring out whether we're moving in the right direction. Um, as important as those assessment tools are, Hal, I also think that we can't be too dependent on numbers. It's really the pattern of behaviors over time that's really critical here. And so um, it doesn't, as far as my experience uh, tells me, the measures are important, but it's really the repeated measures over time that tell. Yeah, us I, I agree. It's repeated measures. You're just using that to get a flavor of our things going up yeah. or down. You know, yeah, it's I, like, it's like, it's like numbers in in the stock market. Is it up today? You know, is it up over the year or down? It's not like you say, oh, they're at a forty. That's great. It's it's this it's these trends over time. It's just that it gets lost in the detail. Parents' lives, people's lives are busy, and so the numbers really help us to say, wow, there was a dramatic change at that point in time. What did we do differently there? Yeah, and, yeah. and that gives us a chance to also engage in a conversation about uh, what else could be going on, right. because right. Um, the parents or the caregivers are essential to understanding um, where all this might have come from, which may be a totally different uh, uh, perspective than what we can provide. And I think it's so valuable to, to go back actually to number one, when in, when in doubt, return to uh, experienced caregivers.
However, uh, I think it's worth pointing out uh, that we're living in a very unusual period of time. And uh, if we experienced the pandemic of 1918, then maybe this would have <laughs> this would have been clear, but we yes. weren't there. And yes. so I think we need to remember that uh, that this is a context of incredible disruption. Right. Um, that we lack uh, access uh, to um, the usual services. Right. Uh, we have a worsening symptoms uh, across all uh, children, uh, both in physical and mental health. Yeah. And limited uh, activities uh, of daily living are a, particularly a problem for children with disabilities. And um, and compounding that, of course, is family isolation, um, loneliness, uh, lack of resources, lack of access, uh, which uh, were there before, but have now been exacerbated by the uh, by the pandemic, and all of those uh, socioeconomic, um, social, ethnic, and I, I would argue racial uh, uh, barriers yes. are heightened, uh, particularly uh, in this uh, setting. And so we need to remind ourselves, um, are we doing everything we can to address them? Because this actually may be making the pain uh, worse. Let's let's talk a little about the clinicians. And that's our last slide, because we wanted the acknowledgement to get to questions. So, oh yeah, I think yeah. we can. Oop. Yeah, you had a slide. Is it not up there about clinicians? The role of clinicians. Yeah, I, um, you want to skip that? That's okay. No, no, it, it's. Uh, I, I think I'm going to. Yeah, it's a good point, Hal. That, that uh, we need to talk about our role as as caregivers, uh, as uh, part of the team, um, because at the end of the day, uh, the words that we use, the intention that we give, uh, and the agency that we convey with a prescription or with a belief that we're going to be able to change the, the irritability and behavior is really at the core of managing pain. And it's particularly true in this setting that uh, as uh, healthcare providers, we have, a, uh, we have a central role bringing knowledge, experience, and the tools with us. But if we can't convey that last millimeter of hope and um, expectation of benefit, then I think that we have, uh, we will have uh, contributed to yeah. therapeutic failure and we won't, we won't easily get to tomorrow. So that's where, <laughs> um, that's where uh, uh, we need to uh, step back and say that actually, uh, I, I think we have the tools in our hands as, as difficult as this work may be, we actually have the tools because at its core, pain management is really a human uh, um, and undertaking. There's great science to it. There's neuroscience, there's imaging, there's good experimental work that goes on across uh, many different uh, domains in our, in our field. But at the end of the day, if we can't make that human uh, contribution to managing pain, then we, have, we will have only contributed to the therapeutic failure. So I want to uh, just uh, highlight a few a few take home messages about um, pain in children with disabilities. It's, it's a common everyday symptom. And I think um, we've highlighted that. And, and it's, uh, it occurs, of course, in the context of a very complex biologic, social, emotional, cognitive uh, context uh, that involves not just the child, the family, and also the caregivers in the community. But pain uh, here and untreated pain will only um, a compound existing disability and uh, re further reduce everyday function. And so, you know, we are challenged to recognize and manage it in whatever tools we have. And, you know, how uh, you've clearly laid out three very valuable uh, pain assessment tools. Um, yeah. And I think we'd, we'd be good to hear from the the family. Well, let's, the, the four let's, points. let's, let's go to, let's go. I'm going to call I'm going to cut you. Let's go to the, um, let's go to the, um, let's go to the questions now if you don't mind, because we've got about 10 minutes here. And if you just throw okay. up the acknowledgement slide, that would be helpful because I just want to highlight the team across the country that's been working on this. Paula, do you want to just, um, sorry, Tim, I just think we need to have time for the questions. Do you want to give us the questions? Sure. I see there's a lot of them here, so. Yeah, there's a few. So Kate, um, who's the mother of a five-year-old kitty with uh, medical complexity, he's developmentally disabled, non-verbal, non-mobile. Okay. She has two questions. Can different types of pain be masked by baseline hyperactivity? Yes. <laughs> How's that? Short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and are children with medical complexity at higher risk for acute pain crisis postoperatively? So let me, let me, let me, the, the, the masking of the hyperactivity. So Kate, I think is the mother's name. Is that right? Yes. So I'd say that, you know, you, Kate, are the best observer. You're better than anybody else. And if you say my child has this pattern of hyperactivity, maybe it's choreothetosis or dystonic movements, but it goes way up 
at certain points. That, you know, yes, it can be because that may be the child's pain reaction. One of the really helpful things that I ask a lot of families is tell me about your child's response to things that you know are typically painful. And, uh, you know, it may be when they were, they get bumped or they're getting in and out of their chair or the sling isn't fitting right. That pain behavior is a good tr- trigger, uh, is a good clue to is this nociceptive slash inflammatory pain. If we think there's an underlying nosoplastic element, that becomes this issue of, well, is that pain? Is it signaling? Is it irritability? So it can be hard to tease apart, but certainly looking at your child's p- patterns of behavior. In terms of the of the the post-operative pain flare, that's one of the things that we want to really be looking at is the way that these children respond to. And it's hard for anesthesiologists in the post-op period to say, how much drug do I need to give? And again, the flack is very helpful. The parent at the bedside is critical, but yes, it can cause stimulation and pain uh, during that time. So sitting and talking to your um, anesthetist pre-op is really, really helpful to tell them what to look for. I hope that answers Kate's question. Kate, let us know if it doesn't. Uh, you can type away. Um, Sam has asked, um, is there a measure that is used to differentiate pain from emotions, such as just being upset or sad or scared for this p- population group? I don't know of one. And that's why we called it pain and irritability of unknown origin. I mean, irritability can be sad or whatever. Tim, I, I don't think people have plumbed the depths. <laughs> I don't think they've even plumbed the surface of the emotional life of children with severe neurologic impairment. But we know that these children have emotional, rich emotional lives, and their parents tell us about those lives when we ask. So that's a key question. Tim, do you have any other thoughts about the emotional? And um, and and by the way, for all of us, emotions dictate pain. We're sad. We're more. We're sleepy. We're more likely to have pain. That's true for everybody, right? Anxiety. That those are all exacerbators of pain. Yeah, I think that uh, we have to be uh, a bit careful about uh, saying uh, pain is um, nociception, which is the hardwired phenomena that we know occurs that triggers the emotional. Uh, the hot stove and, phenomenon. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, tr- that triggers the things that we uh, have associated with pain because we've lived, ex- had lived, lived experience. If we can't tap into that lived experience, it makes it very difficult to understand the hardwiring thing. But I think that uh, any experienced caregiver can tell us um, how uh, happiness, uh, even if the behavior might look somewhat similar to pain, is different from pain. And I think that that's uh, it's really important in taking that history to be able to separate out um, uh, both verbal, nonverbal uh, things that are associated with uh, with what we think is nociception, which is the hardwired phenomena. Um, because we can't tap into memory and the cognitive part. And another question uh, from our audience, uh, are there other approaches currently being used aside from pharmacological approaches to treat pain in this population? Yes, they're not being well studied, but they are being used. So I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, we've had a program working in the, with the West Coast College of Massage prior to the pandemic of doing massage with children. We weren't doing any kind of particular study on it more than just observational, but um, it can be beneficial. Um, We did do a study, Beth Clark, who's now in Massachusetts at University of Massachusetts, is a music therapist or was a music therapist at the time and did a randomized trial of um, nonverbal children's response to music therapy with pain. And she used a very clever design that incorporated uh, musical systems that that work with children who are hard of hearing as well using vibratory music. And uh, she was able to demonstrate using the Nick pick, if I remember correctly, reduction in pain. So we have evidence that all these other things work. I would also say to a parent, um, you know, the best evidence is your child. I mean, when parents, um, you know, if we use Georgia as an example, uh, I say, you're the, you're the person who edited the book on Georgia. I mean, each parent becomes an expert in their own child. And I think, I think my approach to this, and, and, and this is partly personal and partly my ex- professional experience, is when you go to these things, you go to them with kind of an optimistic skepticism, if, I, if you will, which is to say, I am going to try this. This is an experiment because so many people will say, I have the cure for your child. I have the thing that will resolve this, uh, whatever the treatment is, especially if it's not mainstream treatment. And um, if you go to that thinking, wow, we found this healer and he or she's going to do it. If you go in and say, wow, this is an experiment. Let's see if this really helps my child. Then 
you find the things that really work for you. And if that experiment, I mean, this is what Tim and I do as scientists for, for 30 years now. If it doesn't work, you go on to the next experiment and you you chalk that up. So that's how I approach the things that don't fall into the real realm of allopathic Western medicine. But yes, there are uh, things that work and things that we've actually studied, and we would love to study more of these things. Tim, I'm sorry, any thoughts yeah. on that? <laughs> no, that's, uh, I think you've... I think you've uh... You've provided a good answer. There. Okay. Yeah. Another question. What might we take away from this work as um, we move to potentially vaccinating children uh, five to 11 years of age, some of whom may have uh, neurodevelopmental difficulties? Well, I think that the usual, um, uh, the usual preparation for uh, vaccine related anxiety and hesitancy around pain uh, uh vaccine related pain is uh, applies here as well there's just it's no no different i think that uh it's really important that caregivers uh parents in particular are very uh comfortable with i presume you're referring to uh in this question to uh covid related vaccine oh yes yeah. uh, although it applies to any vaccine yeah, yeah absolutely so i think that, ca that caregivers and parents in particular are very important players in uh, preparation for the vaccine that uh, that our role as healthcare providers has to be to ensure a high level of comfort, acceptability, uh, uh, stress reduction, uh, and addressing uh, very specific questions that parents have. I think that that sets the scene for a, a successful vaccination. I, I will say that um, uh, that uh, the usual, although the usual things apply. So if someone wants to use EMLA or another topical agent, uh, that could be equally useful here. Uh, distraction, uh, uh, rubbing of the skin, um, uh, music, all of the usual uh, interventions that we use with, uh, with children and vaccines is equally important. But I think that setting the scene prior to even uh, getting the vaccine ready or even booking the day is, is incredibly important here. And yes, I, I think that there's a uh, Everything we have, everything has to be done to ensure um, that the vaccine can be given in an acceptable way. Yeah. Um, it's this is a setting where we would not want to uh, overlook any opportunity to have a successful outcome. Wonderful. Um, and uh, that brings us to the end of our questions. Uh, any last uh, key messages, um, Dr. Seidner Oberlander? No, I, I think I appreciate, first of all, my, my thanks again to, to Child Bright and to uh, Children's Healthcare Canada for um, hosting this um, event today. And um, I think my appreciation to all the attendees and all the really interesting questions and dialogue that was generated. I hope it's, I hope, uh, it's of, of benefit to you and, and you share it with others. So that's my, that's my closing comment. There's yeah. a number of comments here um, thanking you for your uh, great presentation and Thanks. others talk, talking about how they're um, planning on applying some of this um, where they work. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really grateful to have a chance to uh, come and share and talk. Uh, oh, thank you. This. And uh, there's some great comments here. I'm just seeing uh, it doesn't have to hurt website. Uh, it's, yeah, it doesn't uh, have to hurt. It's very good for uh, vaccination. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the end of our... Absolutely. There's more Thanks coming. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, that's the end of our time together today. Thank you for, uh, to Dr. Seiden and Oberlander for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thanks to all the members who, and other attendees who chose to join us today. We know how busy you all are right now. Um, and we hope you depart with some practical knowledge and the comments in a, uh, we're receiving now would suggest that folks are. Join us for the rest of our November Spark live webinars, uh, still in keeping with the theme of pediatric pain management on November 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, pediatric pain, patient partnership, and research, five studies to keep you in the know. As well, we invite you to register now for our 2021 annual conference taking place virtually November 22nd to 26th. I can't believe how close that is now. <laughs> the theme this year is From Crisis to Catalyst, the next chapter for children's health care. During the conference on November 23rd, Children's Healthcare Canada is pleased to host a tweet chat with um, kids in pain uh, um, and joining me to explore the roles and responsibilities and efforts needed when managing children's pain will be Katie Burney and Stephanie Paravan. 
It's always great if you watch live as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network. And I included the link to that space in the uh, chat. So thanks again for joining us today. Thank you to Dr. Seiden and Oberlander for this presentation. And hopefully we'll see many of you back here on November 17th. Bye, everyone. <music>